Good morning, everybody. We're back here live from the birdhouse. And today we're talking about how you can attract butterflies and moths and hummingbirds as well to your yards. We'll talk about not only those nectar producing plants that are starting to bloom right now that you can put in your garden, but the host plants, the things that the caterpillars really need to develop. And that's what's really the key to having a successful butterfly garden. So that is our topic for today. As always, we love to know what kind of things you're seeing in your yard. If you have any sightings, you can absolutely put those in the comments or you can just say hi. If you have questions, you can throw those in too. And let's get started here talking about butterflies. And I've noticed more and more out. So um, as we get into the summer, we'll start to see more and different types of butterflies and moths too, which is pretty exciting. Um, the first thing I like to talk about is the metamorphosis of butterflies and moths. They go under, they undergo the same type of metamorphosis. Um, so butterflies and moths, they're all insects. So they're all in that order of insects, meaning they have uh, six legs. So they've got three pairs of legs. They have three body parts. Um, they've got the two antenna. So they've, they've got all this structure there of being an insect. And insects will start their life off as an egg. Out of that egg will hatch the larva, which in this case is the caterpillar. That larva will then pupate and out of that pupa, whether it be a chrysalis or a cocoon, will come the butterfly or moth. And so what's important when you're thinking about gardening or setting up your garden for, for the butterflies and moths as well, you want to plant plants for each stage. So it's, um, it's really wonderful to have beautiful blooming plants for the adult butterflies. And that's what you see a lot of the rewarding aspects of butterfly gardening with that, where you see all the adults flying by and drinking nectar. But it's also important to think about those plants that the butterflies will lay their eggs on in order for them to, com to, to continue on with that cycle. So uh, they need some plants that they can lay their eggs on that those caterpillars can eat. And they're not always the same as the nectar producing plants. Um, one that is super simple, of course, is the milkweed because monarch butterflies are dependent on that, not only for the nectar that the plant produces, they'll drink that, but then they also need that plant to lay their eggs on for the caterpillars to eat. So that's a super simple one uh, because you can sustain the population just on one type of plant, but it's usually not the same for every species. And each species has different requirements. So of course there's some overlap, um, but what's the difference? I'd like to talk about what the differences between butterflies and moths are also. Both, uh, both butterflies and moths have larvae called caterpillars. And the caterpillars if you think about the structure of them, they are super, super different than the structure of the butterfly. They look like totally different things. Um, so the caterpillars have mouths that chew. So what's the importance of that? Well, they're chewing a whole bunch of leaf material constantly. If you think about that book, The Very Hungry Caterpillar, it's not too uh, far off there. Um, the caterpillars really, all they do is eat and eat and eat. And in the bottom left here, I've got a picture kind of zoomed in here of the a caterpillar's mouth. So they do have what are called chewing mouth parts. So some insects will chew, some will siphon um, things through little mouth parts that are like straws. So they all have different kind of structures and the caterpillars do have these chewing mouth parts. So they do chew and chew and chew the whole time they are at a, a caterpillar. So here's the caterpillar here with its chewing mouth parts. And then once the caterpillar is pupated and out hatches that butterfly, they will have a proboscis, which is a long uh, kind of curled up tongue that they'll use to probe into plants and suck the nectar out. So the caterpillars will have totally different food than the adult butterflies or moths for that reason. Um, both butterflies and moths are in a, a family called Lepidoptera, which means scaled wing. And this is a zoomed in picture of a butterfly wing. And it shows how they get that 
name. If you look very, very closely, you can see it almost looks like tiny little colorful scales. And those colorful scales are covering the wings of the insect, and that's what gives them their color. If you've ever um, handled a butterfly or moth in any way, or um, you know, if you've swatted one away, something like that, you'll sometimes see that there's a powdery residue. That's going to be these little tiny scales that are on their wings. So that's why their wings are just so delicate. They don't re they don't produce more and more. Once those scales are gone, they're gone. So you can sometimes tell if a, if a, if a butterfly was just recently hatched out, if it's super bright in color. Um, if they're kind of dull, could be an older one that is kind of the last stages of its life. Um, and butterflies and moths. So what's the difference between butterflies and moths anyway? A lot of people will say, well, butterflies are beautiful, brightly colored, and moths are kind of dull in coloration, and that's how you can tell the difference. Um, but that's not the case all the time. So all of the insects at the top here, those are all butterflies, and you can see they're not always all very brightly colored, like the cabbage white butterfly here at the top left. They are, are probably our most common butterfly that you'll see locally in your yards and everything like that, uh, but they're not elaborately colored. And then on the bottom here, these are both moths. And so the moths, well, well they tend to be kind of drab in color. That's not always the case. And um, th that's not the case, especially with these large, the giant silk moths that um, right now are starting to emerge. And um, there's even a really cool moth called the hummingbird clearwing moth, which you might see in your garden. And that's this moth here. Um, so there are some differences and I can tell you what those um, the, what those are. Um, Moe's butterflies are out during the day. In fact, all the butterflies that we have here in our area are out during the day. And most moths are nocturnal, but not all. So for example, this hummingbird clearwing moth here, that's a day flying moth that you can see um, during the day. Most of our moths are nocturnal, but not all. Another day flying moth that's out right now in some really big numbers is this one here in the bottom left. This is called the Virginia centuchid moth. And they're very dark in coloration, but they have a bright orange head. And then they've got an iridescent blue body there. So um, it's not always that butterflies are all out during the day and moths are all out during the night. Um, so here's how you can tell the difference between the two butterflies all have some kind of a projection at the end of their antenna. So they usually have some kind of a ball at the edge, at the very end of their antenna or something that um, that grows larger. So they do have some kind of growth at the end of their antenna, whereas moths have antenna that are either very straight or they look like a feather. Now, most butterflies and all of our butterflies are, are diurnal or active during the night. Most of our moths are nocturnal, active during the night. When at rest, butterflies tend to hold their wings up over their body. They hold their wings upright. Look at the picture of this monarch butterfly here. When at rest, their wings are folded up over their body. However, when at rest, most moths will spread their wings out. So here's a luna moth right here, which is now uh, their season that they'll be out. And when at rest, you can see the moths lie their wings out. Butterflies will form a hard chrysalis and moths will form a cocoon, which is, uh, which has, you know, kind of like some fibers spun around it. If you were to open up those fibers of the cocoon, inside would be a hardened shell of a pupa, but um, butterflies will just form their chrysalis. So here's some of the examples of how you can tell the difference between the two. The top left here is a butterfly antenna, and it does have that little projection, that little ball on the end of it. And then these next two are moths. So moths will e either have antenna that are just perfectly straight or they have these really neat looking, almost like feathery type of antenna. Bottom left here, here's a, a black swallowtail that just hatched out of its hard shell chrysalis. And then moths will form a cocoon, which has some kind of fibers over their pupa. So just some ways you can tell the difference between the two. Normally you can find butterfly chrysalis attached to the stems of plants, attached to the sides of trees. Cocoons, oftentimes you can find um, inside leaves. Sometimes when they're weaving that cocoon, they'll also weave it along the sides of the leaf and the leaf will kind of curl over and protect the cocoon. So those are some of the differences between 
the two. So when you're trying to attract butterflies, you do want to attract for all the stages of their development and their life because the adults may pass by and sip on nectar, but by providing habitat for egg laying, mating, and roosting, that will attract the most amount of butterflies for you. As far as the different types of butterflies go, there are many different species we have here in the upstate New York area. One type are called skippers, and they are these butterflies that have kind of triangular wings. So when they fly, it almost looks like they're skipping. They're kind of flip, uh, flit around. They're quite small. Uh, they're going to be a little bit smaller than, say, your cabbage white butterfly. We have a whole bunch of different species here, so I just grouped them all together in one. Um, but skippers are a type of butterfly we have. Look for their triangular wings here. So we have skippers. Um, the, in the early spring and into the summer, we have these what are called little blues, the little blue butterflies. There's one called the eastern tailed blue, and that's on the left hand side here. When their wings are at rest, when they're folded over their body, all of these little blue butterfly species, they look very white in coloration. But then when they open up their wings, they're a gorgeous, gorgeous blue. And these are a very, very small, uh, very, very small, tiny butterfly, even smaller than skippers. So quite, quite small. You can tell you have an eastern tailed blue. If you look really closely at this picture on the left, on the end of this wing, it has these two little tails that come out of its of so that is the eastern tailed blue. There's also one called the spring azure that's out during the spring. There's a summer azure. So there's different lit, what are considered little blue butterflies you might see around. A lot of the times in the grasses, um, they'll, be, they'll be flying around there. So those are some just very general butterflies we have. Getting more specific, we have lots of different types of butterflies you can attract to the garden. Cabbage whites are one that you probably already have. They are the small white butterflies. They are very common in backyards and gardens because their larvae will eat lots of different things. Not only will they eat plantain and grasses and sedges, uh, but they'll also eat a lot of the things that we plant like cabbages, kales, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, uh, mustard plants. So a lot of some of the, the vegetable types of plants that we plant, they will feed they will feed some, uh, from. So if you're planting any kinds of greens in your backyard, you might just get visits from cabbage white butterflies. If you're noticing something is eating the, um, the, the, the plants that you're planting in your backyard, if there are any kind of green veggies, take a close look. The caterpillar blends in very, very well with the plants, especially if it's kind of wedged up against the stem of the plant, they almost blend in perfectly with them. They're not very large either. Um, so they can go undetected for a while. So they, they can be a pest on your plants. One thing you can do to kind of help avoid this is if you have all your veggies in one spot, you can start putting some of your vegetable plants, um, plant some extras and sprinkle them around your garden with your blooming plants. The adults will come to those blooming flowers and then they'll lay their eggs next door to it on those extra veggie plants that you that you've planted. So some people do that. They'll pick the cabbage whites off of the veggie plants they want, put them on their other plants. It can be a little time consuming, but um, that's one thing you can do if you do want to still attract the cabbage whites and, and not, uh, not have to pick off all of their caterpillars. They are an introduced species, so I will, um, so I will mention that as well. So they're not a native butterfly, um, but they are quite fun to see around in the garden. I have a whole bunch of them on my lavender plants at the moment. Um, tiger swallowtail. So this is another common butterfly that we have in the area. And they can have different color morphs as well. Sometimes they're all yellow. Sometimes they have blue on their wings. There's even color morphs that are almost all black and you can barely see the stripes on them. Um, so they can be vary quite a bit in their coloration. They will lay their eggs high up in trees. So if you ever see uh, eastern tiger swallowtail flying high in the treetops, they're probably laying their eggs up in there. That's where the caterpillars tend to feed. So you're not going to see the caterpillars all too often. And their host plants are larger trees. So it's not just small plants that are great host species for these butterflies, but it's the larger ones too. So for example, 
The tiger swallowtail will lay their eggs on ash trees, if they can find them, um, tulip trees, cherry trees, willow trees, basswood, birch. So they will lay their eggs on a diversity of large deciduous trees. So um, the females can be dimorphic, meaning they can be quite different in their coloration. So they can sometimes have that black color morph. And you can find them in a whole bunch of different types of habitat edges, um, forests, uh, river valleys. You can find them in backyards and city parks. So they have quite a, a pretty big diversity of habitat. There's also a spice bush swallowtail that we have here. Their caterpillar, which is this picture here, um, will have will lay uh, or will feed from spice bush and sassafras leaves. So it's those uh, those leaves that have a really strong smell to them. The caterpillar is pretty neat looking because it has these what are called false eye spots. So it looks like it has these giant eyes on it, when in fact that is just part of its body, its head which has the eyes is way down here at the very bottom. So these are not eyes at all, but those are just a coloration to fool predators that, um, that this is a much bigger animal than it really is. So you can find them a lot in woodlands and wooded swamps, kind of edge habitat, anywhere where you will find the spice bush plant, which is a woodland plant, and then sassafras trees as well. The black swallowtail is really neat. So this is what the adult looks like. Again, they can be kind of different, uh, different colors. Sometimes they'll have lots of blue on them. Sometimes they'll have lots of yellow. So they can vary quite a bit with their coloration. Now their caterpillar get in your garden because they will feed from some of the herbs that are commonly planted in backyards being dill, fennel, parsley. They'll also lay their, uh, they'll, the caterpillars will also feed from Queen Anne's lace. So if you have Queen Anne's lace even growing in your yard and you've been pulling it, considering it a weed, it is a host plant for the black swallowtail caterpillar. So um, they, they can be quite common in herb beds. And what I started doing with my dill and fennel um, and parsley, even parsley this year, I started planting it around my blooming plants in hopes that I would get some black swallowtail uh, laying their eggs on there. Plus, I think it, it, they look cool, especially the dill and the fennel kind of mixed in with flowering plants will give it kind of a, di a di different texture because it's got that really kind of a flower, um, kind of like feather-like leaves. I think it looks kind of neat mixed in with some of the different plants. Uh, swallowtails have something called an osmeterium, which is this structure. If you look at this black swallowtail here, it's got these two kind of orange things sticking out of its head. When disturbed, these osmeterium will stick out of their head. They kind of wave around and they emit a foul, a foul smelling odor to help keep predators away. So if you ever see one in your garden and you poke at it or anything like that, or you touch it, um, you'll see they probably they, re they tend to rear up kind of like this one is they kind of rear up like that. And then they have these orange things that stick out of their head. And that will emit an odor to try to keep predators away. So pretty cool stuff that they do. Um, they like, you know, open areas, of course, fields and meadows, um, gardens, absolutely. The gardens are great. And one way you can identify that you have a black swallowtail as opposed to a spice bush swallowtail or even a black morphed uh, tiger swallowtail is on their wing here the very end of their wing they've got a red dot and inside that red dot there's a little black dot so it's a very small way to tell the difference between the two but that's one way you can figure out the two it's an eye spot so some different types of swallowtails we have here and then finally there's the giant swallowtail which isn't going to be as common uh, but locally, I've heard there's a really good population around high acres, um, if you ever go there for birding and such. They're, the caterpillar of the giant swallowtail will feed on citrus plants, prickly ash, and hops. So if you are growing hops, you might start to see their little caterpillars. Um, their caterpillars tend to look like bird droppings. They are mimics of bird droppings. Um, so you can kind of see it in the corner here. You could easily pass by it without thinking, uh, having a second thought about them because they do mimic the bird droppings. And they also have an orange osmeterium that will stick out of their head when disturbed. So um, really, really neat. You can see it really well here that just sticks out of their head 
and will emit that foul smelling odor. One of my personal favorites that we have around here is the Baltimore checker spot, just a gorgeous butterfly. Um, this is going to be about the size of your cabbage white butterfly. So it's about a you know, medium sized butterfly. Not only is the butterfly beautiful, but so is the caterpillar. The caterpillar is bright orange and black. And these caterpillars will tend to congregate. So most butterflies will lay their eggs one at a time. So you're not going to have a whole congregation of caterpillars all in one plant. That's not the case for the Baltimore checker spot. They'll lay their eggs um, in groups. And out of those groups, you'll get a whole bunch of the little caterpillars and they'll all kind of stay on one plant and then move on to the next plant. And the caterpillars will eat English plantain. If you have plantains that are in your your grass and considered a weed, you might want to keep some of them around because they are a host plant for some of these butterflies. White turtle head is the big one. It's easy to find pink turtle head in garden centers and such, um, but the white turtle head is their host plant. Um, they'll also feed from foxglove and beard tongue, and these are going to be more common in marshes and some wet areas, and of course, again, fields. So, uh, the question mark and comma, these are butterflies that are considered just like how we saw there's the skipper butterflies, the little blue butterflies. These are what are called angle wing butterflies. And if, especially if you look at the photo on the bottom here, you can kind of see why they their wings aren't rounded. They're, they almost look like a crazy cookie cutter shape. Um, so they do have all these kind of nooks and crannies on them. And the question mark and comma are two species that we have here. They look almost identical. So they can be very, very difficult to identify. The only difference really is if you look at the wing of the butterfly, when they're at rest, and so when they've got their wings folded over their body, um, there's a little, almost like a little symbol here. And this one here is in the shape of a question mark. So there's like a little, um, a little rounded sliver and then a dot underneath that looks like a question mark. The comma, the species, the eastern comma, won't have that little dot. They'll just have the little crescent there. So that's how you can tell the difference between the two. So it can be very, very difficult to tell. And their caterpillars will feed on elm, on hops, nettle species. So if you've got false nettle or even stinging nettle around, not that you want to keep that in your garden necessarily, but they are host plants for these question mark and comma butterflies. Basswood trees is another that they'll feed from. They tend to like wet woody areas and marshes. And they, these adult butterflies are ones that will sip on sap and fruit. So you might see them at the side of a tree. If the tree is leaking any kind of sap, you can sometimes see these butterflies on there. Butterfly feeders will have spots for fruit. This is one of the butterflies that might uh, come to eat some of that fruit as well. The morning cloak, we talk about early in the spring months because this is one of the butterflies that spends the winter as an adult. So they will hibernate as the adult butterflies. Most of the time you don't see that, but the morning cloak is kind of the exception. So if you have a butterfly house, the idea of a butterfly house is it's not a spot for the butterflies to lay their eggs in or to breed in or anything like that. Um, what they do is they will go in there to spend the winter. So the key, if you have a butterfly house, is to fill it with long grasses and sticks. And you might be lucky enough to get an adult butterfly like the morning cloak going in there and wedging itself in for the winter. Their caterpillars will feed from willow trees, elm trees, cottonwood, which are all over the place, um, aspen and poplar trees. They're common in forests, along swamps and streams. And they can even be seen flying during warm winter days because they spend the winter as an adult. If we have one of those unseasonably warm days in January or February and you happen to be in the woods, you might just see a morning cloak flying through, even if there's snow on the ground. So it is possible. I've, I've seen it happen once and it's pretty, pretty neat. And because they spend the winter as an adult, this is going to be one of the first butterflies you'll see here in the spring because they don't have to go through that whole metamorphosis to start flying around. They just warm up once the temperature is warm enough and they'll start flying around. So really cool butterfly called the morning cloak. Red admirals you might see in your backyard too. Um, 
these are kind of funny as far as how they look when they're flying. They look super erratic, um, almost like they don't know where they're going. Like they fly really quickly. They're kind of all over the place. I'll see them in my garden here and there. They're there so quickly and they're gone. Um, another thing I've noticed about them is that they tend to perch on the side of houses and they'll kind of put their wings in and out and kind of get some of the sun as the sun's hitting their wings. They do a lot of that, uh, but they, they can't be found in gardens. They are a very dark butterfly with these nice bright orange stripes along their wings here. Um, they, the caterpillar, again, this is another one that will feed on nettle species. So if you do happen to have nettle around, you might want to keep some for these red admiral and those question mark and comma butterflies. You can find these in parks, fields, uh, around marshes, any kind of open fields. They're, they're a common butterfly um, and they are migratory as well. So some years we have huge populations of them that come in. There was, there was one year, it's probably like 15-ish years ago now, where there was a huge influx of red admiral butterflies just everywhere. Um, you couldn't drive down the street without seeing a whole bunch flying around in the air. So that was pretty cool. Um, but they are definitely around all summer long. So that is the Red Admiral. And Viceroy, there's been some Viceroy sightings. You might say, well, this is a monarch butterfly. It is not, although they look a lot like them. The Viceroy is a smaller size butterfly compared to the monarch. So it's going to be larger than, say, your cabbage white butterfly, uh, but smaller than the monarch butterfly. They are a mimic of the monarch butterfly, however, and um, their caterpillar, which also looks like bird droppings, will feed from poplar, willow, and fruit trees. They tend to be seen in wet, um, kind of more wet areas around um, streams and swamps. And the way you can tell the difference between the viceroy and the monarch butterfly is, first of all, the size. So the viceroy is and they also have this stripe that goes through their hind wing. And that's going to be uh, another way you can tell. Sometimes monarch butterflies can be kind of small in size, depending on how much the caterpillar had had to eat. So size can be kind of iffy, um, but they, the viceroy will have this stripe that goes through its hind wing. Even when its wings are folded above its body, you can still see that stripe. So that's how you know it is a viceroy butterfly. And then here is the monarch butterfly. We should start to have more sightings of them now that the milkweed is starting to bloom. The swamp milkweed in my yard started to bloom. And there's lots of buds on it. I've seen the common milkweed is starting to bloom right now. This is one of the butterflies that the, uh, that the, the caterpillars will rely exclusively on the milk milkweed plants. Uh, common milkweed seems to be the one that they feed from the most often that has those really big leaves on it. Um, it's Common milkweed isn't something you're going to find in a garden center that you can buy, um, but you can easily harvest seeds from them in the fall. Um, common milkweed can be a little unruly in gardens, so not everybody likes to have it in the garden because it does spread so much. Uh, but Swamp milkweed is a good alternative that it has smaller, thinner leaves, but you can kind of keep it more contained in the garden. They'll also feed on butterfly weed, which we'll see later when I show you some of the, the nectar producing plants. So they do feed, the caterpillars will feed exclusively on milkweed plants. And the monarch does migrate. So they come up from Mexico. Um, they'll come from Mexico. And as they're starting them, their migration, they'll lay their eggs. Those eggs will develop into the caterpillars, which develop into the butterflies. And then those butterflies will continue the migration up north. So um, it does take a, a few cycles of the butterflies doing that until they come up here. We're usually on like the third generation of that happening when we start seeing them here in the area. And we'll be doing a class, of course, on the monarch butterfly this summer. That's always a popular one. Um, and you can find monarch butterflies in any kind of open areas, fields, pastures, marshes, um, even roadsides, because that common milkweed is a uh, is a plant that will kind of thrive in areas like roadsides and any kind of unattended spots. Um, you can easily find monarch butterflies there. And what would a presentation on 
caterpillars and butterflies and moths be without some moth action here. Um, I thought I'd show you some of the common caterpillars and then some of the maybe not so common um, that we do have around here that are pretty cool looking. This is a tent caterpillar. Nothing to write home about. You might get them in your yard um, or see them a lot on roadsides. They tend to kind of have populations of boom and bust. They get their name because they will form these web-like tents on trees. And inside that tent are a whole bunch of caterpillars. So they will feed from those parts of the tree. And they can defoliate a tree pretty, pretty well. Um, this is what the tent caterpillar looks like. Pretty similar to that of the gypsy moth caterpillar, um, which looks like this. And I like to compare the two because they do look really, really similar. So the tent caterpillar doesn't have any of the red in it. So if you look at it, it's got a whole bunch of black little spots with white in the center. The gypsy moth are going to have more reddish and bluish um, spots on them. Uh, the gypsy moth is native to Europe and it's you know, kind of been an issue uh, around the area, especially around the Finger Lakes area over the past couple of years. They are a threat to trees and shrubs because they will really defoliate them quickly. And um, they eat just about everything, even um, well, most of the time they'll go for deciduous trees. But if they run out of deciduous trees, they'll go to the evergreens as well. So this is the gypsy moth caterpillar. And in the fall, you'll start to see these little guys crawling around. This is the woolly bear caterpillar. Um, I tend to see them a lot by field, you know, fields or if you're hiking, they tend to be in kind of the grassy mowed areas going pretty quickly. They, they, can, uh, they can really get some speed on them. The caterpillar will feed on dandelion, plantain, and grasses and weeds. So you might even see them in your backyard. There is a myth that the longer the middle brown band of the woolly bear caterpillar, the milder and shorter the coming winter will be. The shorter the brown band, the longer and more severe the winter will be. It's really no, um, there's no correlation one way or the other. It just depends on as the caterpillar grows, that brown in the middle will also grow with it. And we tend to see the caterpillar a lot, but not so much the adult. So I thought I'd show you what the adult looks like this in the adult it's called the isabella tiger moth so this is that woolly bear caterpillar and they, they'll be out in the fall season now right now is the time to look for giant silk moths so they are out during the summer months this is the cecropia moth and a lovely lovely moth but also really lovely interesting looking caterpillars you tend not to see these caterpillars so much because they're another one that will feed uh, high up in trees so th these uh, moths will lay their eggs on maple trees, cherry, apple, poplar, oak, sassafras. So lots of the larger deciduous trees. And the like most butterflies, these, these moths aren't alive for very long at all. They tend to mate, lay their eggs, and then die. The males are not around for very long. The females not much longer after as they're laying their eggs. So they're around for a very short window of time. Uh, most butterflies are around for about two weeks or so in their adult form, and then they tend to die off. And these giant silk moths even less so than that. But here's some species of, the, of these that we can find here locally. The Cecropia moth is one. This is called the Royal Walnut Moth. And the, their caterpillar is very interesting. It's it's has a nickname of its own called the Hickory Horn Devil, and you can see why it has all these little um, protrusions on it that look like big horns. And like its name suggests, they feed on hickory, they feed on walnuts, sweet gum, sumac, pecan trees, um, and then you can find these guys in forest parks and gardens. So really cool looking. Um, the Luna Moth is another of the giant silk moths. Again, they lay their eggs on some of these larger trees like hickory and willow, maple, and you can find them in open habitat and forests as well as in gardens. And they, their caterpillar is bright, bright green in, in color, just like the adult is there. Now here's a little one. This is not a giant silk moth, but it's a very small one. So this is about yeah, maybe an inch or so long. This is called a rosy maple moth. And I just think they're, they're so interesting looking. We do have them here in the area. The moth itself is bright yellow and pink. And the caterpillar almost looks like a smaller version of that hickory.
and they will lay their eggs on maple trees, including silver maple trees, which there are a lot of around, and, and oak trees as well. So you might just happen to see these by your porch lights at night. You never know. And they like places with large, mature maples. So if you have any in your neighborhood, keep an eye out for the rosy maple moth. And the hummingbird clear wing. So this is that day flying moth. And they will lay their eggs on the viburnum, hawthorn, honeysuckle, and fruit trees. They're, they are out during the day. And this is what their, uh, what their caterpillar looks like here. And it's got that little kind of horn that comes out of its backside. They're often mistaken for hummingbirds and for bumblebees because, first of all, they're out during the day and they will feed on brightly colored plants, any of those tubular plants, any kind of the plants that are attracting your hummingbirds will also attract the hummingbird clearwing moth. They love bee balm. Um, they love the liatris or blazing star. Here's one feeding from them. And they feed just like a hummingbird will. They hover around and they'll, they'll feed from the plants. So if you see something that looks like a hummingbird but looks a little off, it could very well be this hummingbird clearwing moth. There's different ways to attract butterflies, not just from plants, uh, although I'll show you some of the nectar producing plants. Butterflies do this thing called puddling, especially the male butterflies. And if you've ever gone hiking around the side of a stream or the side of a pond and you see a whole bunch of butterflies around the outside, what they're doing is puddling. They're going to that wet mud that's around the side of the water and they're soaking up not only some of the water, but the nutrients that are in the soil. So not only do they need nectar and things, but they also need some of those, you know, electrolytes and salts um, that can be found in soil and in sand. So this is a behavior you might see if you're spending any time outdoors. So you can make your own butterfly puddler to encourage puddling in your backyard. And you can do this really simply by using you know, any kind of old dish, a bird bath, um, any kind of saucer. You might have a plant saucer you don't use anymore. The key is you want to fill it with some rocks, with some soil, with some sand. And if you put uh, some larger rocks in the middle, that can be helpful too as a place for them to kind of sit where it's totally dry. And you want to make sure that there's some water in it that keeps the water and the sand wet at all times. And the butterflies will land in there and they'll siphon off some of the water and also get some of the salts and minerals that they need out of that butterfly puddler. If you're trying to attract butterflies and you want to add something that's not a plant, this would be the thing I recommend the most. There's also feeders, there's the houses, but the butterfly puddlers are what really seem to work the best as far as attracting more to your garden. So here's your typical butterfly feeder. They are really similar to hummingbird feeders. They usually have a couple differences. Um, they are a reservoir for nectar, so inside you do put nectar. And what makes a butterfly feeder different though, is that the butterfly feeders will have these little wicks and those wicks will dip into the nectar and that moisture will wick up. Um, so it's above the, it's above the feeder here. The butterflies will land on the feeder and dab away at the wick, getting some of that sugar water out of the feeder. And sometimes the butterfly feeders will also have little spikes on them, almost like your Oreo feeders will for oranges. But these spikes are for other types of fruits, like you can put banana on there. You can put any kind of fruit that's starting to go bad. Um, cantaloupe is another one I often see on butterfly feeders. So any kind of old fruit you can put on there and that can attract some butterflies as well. This is an example of the butterfly of a butterfly house. I was talking about these a bit with the morning cloak butterfly. These are to attract some of those butterflies um, like the morning cloak or the tortoiseshell butterflies that will spend the winter as an adult. So the key for these is filling them full of sticks and grasses in hopes that they will wedge in there to spend the winter. So if you're looking to put something out to attract a whole bunch of butterflies, this isn't quite the right thing to do. The best thing you can do is put different plants out. Uh, but this does look pretty cool in the garden and you never know, you might get some going in there for the winter. If you want to see what kind of moths you have out, this is something you can do. This is my setup I did over the weekend to kind of see what, what kind of moths I had out there. Really entertaining. Um, <laughs> if you hang up a white sheet and shine lights on it, 
um, the moths will be attracted to the light. I did both white lights and black lights to see if the mix would make any kind of a difference. And I was hoping for some of those giant silk moths. To so I didn't see any, although this is the time of year you can start seeing them, but there are some different ones. A lot of them, um, you know, kind of drab, different color moths, but there were uh, some some pretty interesting ones too. One that kept popping up was this Virginia Centucha moth here, and that's another one of the day flying moths um, that we do have around the area. So you can see those right now, um, even during the day, they've got that really cool feathery antenna, the orange head, and then that blue body. So there were a lot of those being attracted to the, to the sheet. So I thought that was pretty cool, but that's one way you can, you can test the waters and see what kind of things you have in your backyard. And then gardening for butterflies and hummingbirds. There's different nectar producing plants that you can put out. And the key is you wanna plant long tubular, brightly colored plants. A lot of these will also attract hummingbirds. So you kind of get a twofer with these. The color red draws hummingbirds in. So they are attracted to that color. And purples and yellows tend to attract butterflies. With um, gardening for these guys, you wanna make sure to avoid any kind of pesticides, that is insects that you are attracting with these plants. So if you lay pesticides out, not only will you kill the insects you don't want, but you will kill the ones that you do. So that's something important to definitely avoid if you are doing gardening for hummingbirds and butterflies. Here's some nectar producing plants that I've found work really well. If you have some plants that work well, well in your, your yard, I'd love to know what they are. You can put those in the comments. Bee balm is awesome, starting to bloom now. It's available in different colors. Um, you can get bright red, you can get purples. Now they have shorter bee balm, like bee balm tends to be kind of tall, but you can get shorter ver versions now, dwarf versions. So there's lots of options out there. They're a type of herb, so actually the the leaves have a really strong kind of smell um, and they're they're a native species as well. Hummingbirds love these. This is what my hummingbird clearwing moth goes to more so than anything. I see them at the bee balm. So this is this is a, a really easy to grow perennial um, perennial native. Columbine. So there's different types that you can get of columbine. This version in the picture is our native species, which I found is pretty difficult to get. I was able to find one somewhere. It might have been from um, Amanda's Garden, which is a local-ish nursery we have here in Rochester, and they have all native. So they they do all native plants. And I believe I got mine from there. You can get non-native species that the hummingbirds will still go to. Um, the, the, plant, the plant itself, the flower itself will look a little bit different, but it does produce nectar. Blooms early in the spring and it's great for migrating hummingbirds because it is one of the earlier plants that's bright colored red that the hummingbirds will go to. So this is that native columbine there. It's really, really pretty looking. Lupines. Lupines are another way to attract hummingbirds and butterflies. There's both native and non-native species. Black-eyed Susan, they are long blooming. They're easy to grow. They spread quite a bit. So you might have neighbors that are trying to uh, thin theirs out that you can get um, a really good nectar producer for the butterflies. And then once they go to seed in the fall, goldfinches will um, come to those. Same with the coneflower. Cardinal flower seems to be the favorite of hummingbirds in my yard. Um, the cardinal flower has tall stalks of these red flowers. It's really beautiful. It's native. And this is a fantastic one for your hummingbird and butterfly garden. Cone flowers, again, easy to grow, long blooming. And um, they as they go to seed in the fall, again, the goldfinches love the cone flower. So great for, for, for butterflies. And then your songbirds come the fall. There's trumpet vine and trumpet honeysuckle. Again, two native species. The trumpet vine is on the picture on the left here. And the trumpet vine has larger blooms. The trumpet vine also tends to 
um, it can take over things if, if left unattended, if left to its own devices. Um, it can be kind of hard to control. So trumpet vine, I would say, is better in kind of a large spot um, that you're really looking to cover, large, you know, shed, large trellis. If you're looking for something smaller, trumpet honeysuckle is really good. Um, I've got that on a trellis in my backyard. It starts blooming early in the spring. It still has some blooms on it. It's much easier to maintain. And again, it's got those long tubular flowers and the hummingbirds love that as well. There's Joe Pieweed. Um, this is one of another one of my favorites. It blooms in the summer. It looks like it's going to bloom any day now. It's starting to have those buds. It has lots of tiny, tiny little flowers that are bright purple. Bees love it. The butterflies love it. And it blooms, it'll bloom through the fall. So I really like this. It's easy to grow. You can find it in garden centers now. Um, it's e pretty easy to grow from seed. It just takes a while for it to, you know, really establish itself. Um, but Joe Pieweed, I've planted in every place I've ever lived and I've had really, really good luck with it surviving and thriving. Similar to the Joe Pieweed is New York Ironweed. This can grow really, really tall. The one in my backyard is now about, probably about six feet tall or so. Um, I've seen it grow up as maybe as high as like 10 feet tall. It can get really, really big. And uh, later in the summer, it'll have these beautiful bright purple flowers on it. Again, another really popular one with the bees and with the butterflies. And I think it's just gorgeous. It really makes a big statement in the garden. And like its name suggests, New York Ironweed, it is a native as well. Asters are great for the fall. Um, they are another source of nectar, especially for those migrating monarchs as they're starting to make their migration back down south in the fall. Um, it's important to have some fall blooming plants and asters are one of those. And even goldenrods. I've been struggling a bit with goldenrod um, popping up everywhere in my garden. And that can be one that really spreads quite a bit too. Um, what I've been doing is thinning it out and I have it in a couple patches. Again, for these fall migrators like the like the, the monarch and then the bees love it as well too. So I've been keeping some of it in the garden, um, although it's it, it's getting a little unruly here and there, but in the fall, it looks gorgeous. And the, the bees and butterflies really, really love it. Sedum is another fall blooming plant that you can get. And then there's other non-natives. If you're looking for some hanging plants, fuchsia is a really good one. Um, lantana, I've seen that in hanging baskets now. I, I just picked one up this year. Lantana is an annual, as is the fuchsia. Um, but lantana, I put in the bare patches in my garden, it creates a lot of nectar. So it's really good for butterflies. Further down south, like in Florida, it can be considered an invasive because it lives all year long and it can grow and spread quite a bit. Um, but here it's an annual, so you don't have to worry about it being invasive here. And um, it it's, comes in different colors. You can get it in pinks and yellows and reds and oranges. And it is a really good one for butterflies. Gladiolus hummingbirds will come to um, those tall stalks of flowers are, are good nectar producers. Butterfly bush, which again, can get unruly. Um, that one is another really good nectar producer for both hummingbirds, butterflies, those hummingbird clearing moths, bees. So um, those can get kind of big too. So that would fill a nice big patch of your garden. And what works in your yard? I'm curious if there are things that work in your yard really well. You can put those in the comments and share those with everybody. So that's everything I have shared with you guys for today. If you have questions, put them in the comments. We'll see who's on here. Dina is on. She says, good morning, everybody. Um, Randy says, hello, Liz and everyone. Um, Randy also says, milkweed plants are growing tall. Been searching, uh, been searching since the leaves for front activity. So the uh, sounds like no activity yet as far as butterflies and um, probably caterpillars go, but it's only a matter of time. Um, Dina says, I've had a gorgeous red-headed woodpecker visiting occasionally this last week or so. This morning he made his way to the jelly feeder. First for me to have a red-headed woodpecker. All right. So yeah, that's pretty um, uncommon. We have a lot of the red-bellied woodpeckers, um, but red-headed woodpeckers are not a common one for people to get in their backyards. So that's a really, really cool sighting. So congratulations on your woodpecker. And that's, you never know what's going to come to, to the jelly. We were getting all kinds of reports of different things coming to the jelly, which is fun. Um, 
the analysis is, I, I learned so much uh, from you. Thank you. Of course. Yes, you're very welcome. Thank you to everybody who adds their sightings and photos. It's it's fun to see what everybody's getting. Um, Ed says, great show. Thanks. I'll have to bookmark it for reference. It's always a little bit of joy to see one of these colorful beauties flying through the yard and woods. Yeah, I can't, I can't agree more. And I, and I found that too. It seems like over the years, the more my plants and the more established everything gets, the more and more I'm, I'm seeing. It's if you build it, they will come. And it's, it's, it's true. It's amazing what you can get. I just have a really small backyard in the city and it's amazing the things that will roll on through. Um, so it looks like that's everybody's comments and questions for the day. We'll be back on Saturday with another broadcast where we'll share your photos and we'll give you an update on not only the different things you can find in your garden as far as butterflies and and bugs and such but of course the bird activity to feeders and we'll give you an update on those baby birds the fledglings the orioles what's going on with them so um should be a good broadcast so we will see you on saturday and until then enjoy your week and have a great day Bye bye